Are we good? You are muted. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. By all means, go ahead. Okay. Welcome everybody to the webinar, Transformative Justice and the Ending Incarceration of Women and Girls and the Case for Reparations. Thank you for joining us. This webinar is the fourth in a series of webinars on anti-racism and peace sponsored by the Racial Justice and Decolonization Working Group of Massachusetts Peace Action. The next webinar in the series is War Upon Us, Black Lives Matter, Challenge to White Supremacy and Empire on August 25th from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. My name is Yoav Ilani and I'm a member of the Racial Justice and Decolonization Working Group of MAPA. I hope you had a chance to look at the slides that were shown on the screen. I will not go over these slides that serve as an in introduction to the webinar. Now I would like to introduce our presenters, Andrea James and Amilcar Shabazz. Andrea James is a visionary, a fighter, and a super organizer. She is a formerly incarcerated woman, founder, and executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. This organization is engaged in a campaign to end the incarceration of women and girls in our country, as well as to provide support to formerly incarcerated women and girls. I have joined the National Council and I encourage you to join as well. Let us all work together to end the incarceration of women and girls. This is a fight that we should win because it is so human, so basic. It's about mothers, sisters, and daughters. It's about the kind of society we wish to have. Andrea will share with us her thought for 20 minutes, and then she will be followed by my brother, Amilcar Shabazz, who is teaching history and African-American studies at UMass Amherst. Amilcar is a passionist activist intellectual, which is a very special combination in our time. Amilcar will talk about reparations. The Racial Justice and Decolonization Working Group of MAPA grew out of a book group who read the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. We are his students. So I would like to end this introduction with what he says about reparations. Reparations is a litmus test for whatever of for whether a person is being a racist or an anti-racist when it comes to one of the most damaging racial inequities in our time, the racial wealth gap. To oppose reparations is to be racist. To support reparations is to be anti-racist. The middle ground is racist ground. And so I hope that we can all together be part of a powerful movement to push for reparations to Native American and African Americans. This will be another huge transformative process that will steer us away from poverty, violence, and wars, and bring peace and progress to our communities. We thank Andrea and Amilcar for volunteering their time to talk to us. It is highly appreciated. I also want to thank my friends at MAPA who worked on this webinar. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for this invitation, Cole and Johab. Thank you uh, very, very much. Really looking forward to hearing the professor as well. Um, so I will jump right into the work that we do and why. Um, I am, as you uh, described, a formerly incarcerated woman. I'm also a mother and a wife. I'm also a former criminal defense attorney uh, here in Boston, Massachusetts. And um, I was sentenced in 2010, uh, yeah, 2000, uh, 
2010, I served a two year federal prison sentence uh, for a real estate uh, uh, um, mistake that I made that turned into a two year federal prison sentence. And so while we were in that prison at that time, um, I was sent to Danbury, Connecticut. There are no women's prisons in Massachusetts. My uh, children, at the time I had two young adult daughters who were in college at the time. I had a baby girl who was at the time 12. She just graduated from college in May. And I had my last child who was a baby boy who um, was uh, just turned six months old at the time that I uh, went, went to prison. And so I was uh, a mother uh, crammed into a prison with almost 2,000 other uh, incarcerated, predominantly black women who were mostly there uh, for drug uh, convictions. And um, everybody that was in that prison with me at the time were women from cash poor communities. They were, uh, for the most part, cash poor women. The majority of these women were mothers. The majority of them were black women. They were black and brown women for the most part from communities around the country, from other uh, black and brown communities. And this was 2010 where we were he when we heard the uptick um, in the need to end what was referred to then as mass incarceration. Um, and uh, we, uh, uh, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, had ca came out in 2010. Um, and we also uh, heard the, the report out about the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, um, and Democracy Now! We would listen on our, to NPR on our, uh, on our and, Democ and Democracy Now! on our trans little clear radios in the prison. Um, and they were telling this weeks long series of the exposure of ALEC, the American Leg Leg Legislative Exchange Council, and the Koch brothers, and the people that were these billionaire, this billionaire network led by the Koch brothers who were um, investing in the architecture and the apparatus of mass incarceration. And uh, we were learning all this and, uh, and reading uh, the new Jim Crow and reading, of course, Angela Davis. And we organized in the classroom initially before all this other information came into the prison, we organized using Ruth Wilson Gilmore's book, The Golden Gulag. That book, at the end of that book, it, it talks about the work that women are doing uh, and were doing when she was writing that book in the communities around uh, Los Angeles. Um, and The Golden Gulag, which describes um, uh, the night uh, view of the just up the coast of California, the prisons. And after all, in this country from 1996 to 2008, we built a prison every 10 years and we crammed it full of black and brown people from those from communities around this around the country. And so we were at that time, the prison was uh, built to, to house about 1400 women. At that time, there were just under 2000 women in the prison, the women's prison in Danbury, Connecticut. Um, and we were in there head to toe, head to toe, head to toe. I remember looking up uh, over my bunk one night and saying, my goodness, uh, this must be what it's like um, and even worse conditions, but certainly the, the architecture of the, the way that they had us placed in the prison reminded me of a slave ship. And so we sat in the prison yard uh, one very hot day, we had been talking about this quietly because we weren't allowed to organize in the prison and we were threatened for organizing. Uh, and I had an opportunity to teach uh, GED classes and we used that classroom to organize. Um, and then one day we sat around the table outside in the prison yard where it was one of the places where we were relatively left alone as long as we didn't touch each other. Um, and we could have a conversation that was in the open air where they people couldn't listen to us. And we decided to create the organization that we now call Families for Justice as Healing. And that organization was named and started inside of the Federal Prison for Women. And so we unapologetically advocate on behalf of ending incarceration of women and girls. Um, and uh, we do this work. We are an abolitionist organization. We now EFJA is part of a network of hyper-local organizations led by formerly incarcerated women that come under an umbrella 
called the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And just uh, for my last few minutes, I'll share with you the work that we're doing after a two year listening tour, uh, we had to figure out because our goal, which we set back in 2010, when people were not talking about abolition, except of course for our, our leaders in this work, who have been talking about it for de decades, uh, Angela Davis and Critical Resistance and our other organizations that we follow the lead of. But um, in 2010, we were determined that our goal was going to be to end incarceration of women and girls. Um, and uh, we planted that flag inside of that prison and we've been uh, working on that ever since. And we had to figure out though, how do you operationalize a massive goal like ending incarceration of women and girls. And the first thing that we knew we had to do was to go and talk to our sisters about what that means. What is needed? What are their thoughts? What are their ideas? And we've come up with what we now call, after two year listening tour around the country, culminating in a 35 city town hall led by the most directly affected women, not just formerly incarcerated women and girls, but also women and girls who are the loved ones, who are the community members, who are the people who have been upholding communities that have been uh, disrupted economically, that have been disrupted culturally, that have been disrupted familial, uh, their families have been torn apart by the pr prison industrial complex. Um, and we asked these women to come together and they did around the country. And we came out with what I think if I can share my screen, I will uh, attempt to share with you this is the work that we now do that was a culmination, uh, the result of a culmination of all of the ideas of women, uh, most directly affected women around the country. And so our, our campaign is uh, uh, um, reimagining communities and we're imagining a community with a neighborhood led infrastructure and systems for community accountability, economic and personal development all led by the most directly impacted women and girls from their communities. And we do this through an infrastructure uh, that is made up of six building blocks um, that are hyper-local. Now this is just an infrastructure. The sisters, we, we're a national organization in name only, and we do some national campaigns such as the campaign to end incarceration of women and girls. We do our national clemency campaign. We do things in that nature, but we are all a collective of formerly incarcerated women and girls who are in hyper-local communities. I'm from Roxbury, Massachusetts. That's where I've been. That's where my family in the house that I'm talking to you from has been for five generations. And my political home is Families for Justice as Healing in Roxbury. So although we're a national organization, it's because as women across the country, we have stitched ourselves together like a quilt to do this work collectively, but our work is hyper-local in each of our communities. And so these building blocks are where we do our work from. One is participatory defense. Um, it is community led. We're part of the National Participatory Defense Network that's come out of Silicon Valley uh, Debug, uh, which is an organization that for 11 years has been working with families, families helping other families to wrestle and tangle and detangle and untangle our loved ones from the criminal legal system. Participatory budgeting, very important piece to our work. In all of our organizing, in every lo hyper local community, our, our sisters are engaged and involved with the, with the young people, with uh, the men and boys, with our, um, our LGBTQ plus communities in looking at the budget. What does the budget for, the, for, for, the, for our city look like? What does the budget for our state look like? Because it's demonstrated over a 10 year look back that we've done, the level of austerity in investment in the most incarcerated communities um, around the country, including here in Massachusetts, along the Nubian Square to Franklin Hill, Franklin Field housing development, which is the most incarcerated corridor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, yet we have had just zero investment in our people, in our communities, as they continue to uh, create a police presence and occupy our community. Um, so we do participatory budgeting and we've created the people's budget. 
The other part of that that we heard resounding over and over again in our, uh, our listening tours from our sisters was economic development. And so we've started a cooperative fund to help formerly incarcerated people in general, men, women, children, we're the last hired, first fired. And that has been really exacerbated as a result of COVID-19. And we have no confidence that we are going to regain any sort of uh, the small economic uh, growth that we were beginning to, uh, to experience due to our uh, development of co-op businesses. And we certainly don't believe that uh, capitalism is going to be the answer to help our people um, out of this uh, dire situation that our communities are in now as a result of COVID-19 and the pandemic of prisons. For us, the, the original pandemic was the pandemic of prisons. We were already dealing and wrestling with that prior to being slammed now by the pandemic of COVID-19. The Liberation Project is something that's very important. We fought for our mantra was nothing about us without us. And for years, we fought to be included at the policy table around issues dealing with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. And for years, there were a lot of academicians and, and other folks that were at that table, but we weren't included. We, want, we need researchers, we need academia, we need everybody at the table, but we need to be at that table also. What came along with that though, unfortunately, was a platform that was created for just any formerly incarcerated person. Now that only becomes a problem. You are an expert if you wanna share your story about how the carceral system has affected you and your life and, and those you love. That's your story and you are the expert. But if you make a choice to step out of that place of telling your story and you wanna be referred to as an expert, we insist, demand, as formerly incarcerated people, that you understand the historical and the political context that got us to where we are today. If you don't, then you are at risk of carrying water for people like the Koch brothers, like the libertarian agenda, like things that are causing great harm in Black communities right now, because people are uninformed about what's happening um, uh, around that libertarian agenda. And so we created the Liberation Project uh, training for directly impacted women. A year ago at the Free Her Conference, we brought 250 formerly incarcerated women and their children through the EJI Legacy Museum experience on purpose so that si these sisters could understand the, the, the trajectory from slavery to, to, to where we are today. Clemency, we have a national clemency campaign. We are fighting in every single state for clemency for women, our elders. We have elderly women. They're elderly, they're on walkers, they're sick, uh, they need to come home. They've given their pound of flesh. They've been in prison for decades. We're fighting for them to come home. The other category we're fighting for are long timers, women who have been in prison just more than 10 years. You need to get a second look, you need to come home. The other ones are, are terminally ill sisters who are sick or terminally ill, particularly during COVID. We've been on the mat for months fighting, women are dying. We've lost sisters inside of the prison as a result of COVID-19 and we're fighting on behalf of our sisters and clemency is one of the tools that we're using. And the last category of clemency that we're fighting on behalf of for the women is called survived and punished. It's a category that includes women who were battered and they struck out and a, a, and a, and a one incident happened where they fought back and their abuser their batterer uh, died as a result of it. The, that category is known as survived and punished, and we're fighting to get those women home. The last thing that we're doing collectively as part of this uh, foundation within our hyper-local neighborhoods is called Transform Harm. We've been following and mentored by Mariam Kaba, Andrea Ritchie, and a number of other women that have been teaching us about transformative justice for years. And we've uh, uh, created a, a a, a user-friendly community-led process called Transform Harm to address interpersonal harm and violence in our neighborhoods that will not require us to call the police. We are already people and living in communities where we don't call the police. So for us, this is not a big stretch. We already don't call the police, but yes, we do need an alternate system that's a community-led system that helps us to uh, address 
interpersonal harm and helps us to create and elevate individual and community accountability. So those are the things that we're working on um, under our reimagining communities um, uh, infrastructure. And um, again, this, this work is all being led through a people's assembly process. We've worked with Rukia Lumumba, uh, 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 Chokwe Lumumba's, the uh, Honorable Chokwe Lumumba's uh, daughter, and also the young Jokwe's sister, who is currently the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. We have been deep uh, in learning uh, uh, with uh, uh, the People's Assembly process um, um, from, from, the, from that group in, in Jackson, Mississippi, along with we've been receiving lots of help from the Southern Reparations Loan Fund to help us with the economic development cooperative business piece. And so uh, we rely uh, on our comrades in other parts of the country who are deep in the abolition revolutionary work. Um, and we're uh, very happy to be here with you this evening and sharing this information. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. And uh, welcome, Amilcar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you, are, you are muted, Amilcar. Uh, we I'm here now. Can you hear me? Yes, Good. we will continue to take questions and we thought that if you can give a presentation for about 20 minutes that will give us some time for question and answer at the end. Uh, we are going to finish around eight o'clock. Very good. So go ahead, brother. All right. Sorry for my delay in getting here, but I am so glad and so honored to be on this program with Andrea James. Uh, what she has presented, I don't want to take away too much time. I want us to be able to drill down and talk about how we can support that, that work. Uh, but in the spirit of the, uh, uh, of the conversation here, uh, let me add, uh, offer a few things. First of all, always honored to participate with uh, the work of Weston uh, Mass. Um, you know, I was with you all uh, for the Martin Luther King Day uh, back in January. I uh, told you all then, I had been to the mountaintop. I had communed with Dr. King. I had communed with Henry Highland Garnet. And what was my word then? I said this year, 2020, was going to be the year of resistance, critical resistance, resistance, resistance. And lo and behold, all of this accumulated abuses and usurpations of Breonna Taylor, of George Floyd, of so many others, this long train of abuses and usurpations has produced people out in the street despite a pandemic, despite the COVID-19, getting out in every way possible to say, no mas, time is up, we must have change and getting down to the fundamentals, to the radical analysis of what is the problem of capitalism, racial capitalism in this country, getting down to the fundamentals of it and saying we're tired of half measures, we're tired of the reforms. We want to shut this racist, uh, 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 unjust system down and build a new society, a new world, founded on principles of freedom, justice, and equality for all. And this is moving, brothers and sisters. This is moving in the world. And right here in Western Mass, we are getting on board and all of us are all in. So I appreciate all of those who are participating in the Zoom, who will watch it later and sharing with this. And so let me dive right into the topic of, of tonight. And I want to, uh, as, the, as the people say today, especially the young people, I want to be a little vulnerable and open myself up. And, and, and I hope it's, it's a safe space to do that. When I was in prison, don't be shocked when I say I was in prison. You're still in prison. That's what America means, prison. These words of Brother Malcolm, have haunted me and guided me throughout my life. Through my older brother, I've been in prison. It was just me and my brother coming up, two siblings. I, my dad remarried, I have three other siblings from his, from his uh, other marriage, but my older brother and I, very close, 
And as we grew up and later raised by our mother by herself, okay, I watched him, I watched his, our, our world fall apart as he descended into a cycle of addiction. Guys coming back from the Vietnam War turned him on to heroin. And we didn't have all this talk about opioid crisis then. Back in the 70s, you were strung out, you were a junkie. That's how society looked at you. You were, you were addicted to opioids, you were addicted, you were a junkie. Your life was junk, you were human junk, garbage, trash. And all you deserved was, was, the, was the fear and, and derision and, 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 and hatred of civilized society. And you deserve to be put away and put down and locked away forever uh, uh, to protect people because you are a junkie. That's how, the, that's how they looked on, on people like uh, on my brother and other people who were caught up in that as the, as the dope dealers. And yes, Nikki Bonds and big time black dope dealers bringing the drugs back in the, in the bodies of, of, of victims of the, of the Vietnam War. People died in the war and they stuffed heroin packets in it and then they put it out on the streets and we, and we got a whole generation, junkies. And my brother was one of them, three and a half years older than me. And I watched his life descend into hell and the whole family went to hell with him. The whole family went to prison with him. The women he had, the young women, he had children with. Five, five children. Five different going to hell with him. And he was in and out of prison, in and out of prison. Mass incarceration. I saw it from the 70s. I felt it. I was in hell with him. I was in prison with him. And every level, every kind of prison, the private corporation, I was reading up on this dude, George Wackenhut, a former FBI man, who along with a couple of others created this Wackenhut Corporation. They'd later been bought out by some Dutch folk and they've been bought out by some British folk, and, but they still exist now, some kind of G for S security solutions, building private prisons, private prisons. He was in one of the first of these private prisons in the state of Texas, which if you know anything in this country, Texas is one of the biggest prison farms, prison states in the country. I'm from Texas. You know what they call the, the diagnostic center they send you through before they figure out which prison they're going to put you in for your time? It's called Gore. G-O-R-E-E, -E, the Gore unit. That's the same name as the, the dungeon, the slave dungeon in Senegal, where our people were put before they were put on the slave ships to take them across the, the, metal, the middle passage to go into slavery, the Gore unit. They go through that in Huntsville, the Gore unit, and then they farm them out, Jester 1, Jester 2, Jester 3, or whatever it is. And then later on, it became all of these Texas Department of Corrections started privatizing and it started being these different private prison farms. I've been to see them in all of them. I've been to Jester's, the different Jester's. I've been up to Huntsville. I've been out to uh, uh, Kyle, Texas, where the Wacken Hut farm was when he was in Wacken Hut. Been all them places. And let me tell you, we deserve reparations for all this war and drugs craziness that generations were put through, people were put through, traumatized and put through. So I want to connect this, I, this issue of reparations. And to do that, I want to bring uh, in, I want to recommend a book just came out a couple of months ago called From Here to Equality. Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century is written by William A. Darity Jr. and Kirsten Mullen. They're a husband and wife. Uh, Sandy Dar William Darity, people know him as Sandy Darity. He grew up in Amherst. He went to Amherst Regional High School. His father was the dean that created the School of Public Health at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He lived and worked in this area for decades. And Sandy grew up here 
but Sandy is now down at, 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 in North Carolina. He's a professor uh, at Duke University. But he and his partner wrote this book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. And I really, really encourage individuals, groups of people to sit down with that book, read it, form study groups, and really uh, uh, look at what he say. But in the last chapter, which is entitled A Program of Black Reparations, the last few paragraphs, he, he talks about how with this pro, with, with moving in the direction of reparations, we would create a National Reparations Bureau. We'll be established as the civil service agency responsible for day-to-day -day management and execution of the program of reparations. The NRB will work closely with the General Accounting Office to ensure the financial fidelity of the Black Reparations Program. The Reparations Agency staff will provide recipients on an ongoing basis with information uh, about scams and fraudulent schemes directed against them, as well as other matters relevant to successful personal management of their resources. The agency also will develop a financial management curriculum to be made available to all students and adults via public schools and other voluntary organizations like communities of faith starting before the inauguration of the reparations program. This will ensure that all recipients can receive pre-reparations preparation for managing their new portfolios. In addition, the NRB will facilitate reparations recipients engagement in participatory research and monitoring of the program themselves. There will be a highly accessible and user-friendly website where participants um, in the reparations program can report verifi verifiable past and ongoing instances of racial injustice to maintain a complete public record, report internal abuses within the reparations program itself, and seek additional assistance validating claims about their ancestry that will help them to establish eligibility for reparations. Further, the NRB will be charged with implementing a concerted education effort to document, preserve, and communicate America's history of racial injustice, the conditions that led to the adoption of a reparations program, and the impact of the whole of the reparations program on African American well being and the nation as a whole. The intensive phase of the public education effort should last a minimum of three generations or 90 years as was the case with the National Holocaust Museum's Never Forget campaign, it is vital that America's racial history be put at the fore of the conversations Americans have about the nation's past, present, and future. Therefore, beyond the intensive phase, the educational dimension of the reparations program should continue in perpetuity. The reparations agency can promote age-appropriate textbooks and lesson plans designed to be used at all levels of public school. In addition, the agency can devote resources to educators, historians, and artists in developing plays, music, visual art, video games, board games, documentary films, feature films, and new biographies and research studies that bring greater accuracy and depth to America's racial history. With the support of the NRB, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Register of Historic Places, state historic sites, plantations, and Civil War battle sites can all contribute to a transformative national process of reinterpretation and learning. Dissemination of the most up-to-date knowledge and scholarship on race, history, and reparations can take place via social media as well as traditional media. New plaques or markers can be installed that commemorate persons who were heroes of the struggle for racial equality and justice and commemorate victims of lynchings or riots conducted by white supremacists. The work of a national memory and national consciousness is an essential component of an effective program of black reparations. Reparations will directly confront the particular structures of injustice that have freighted the lives of black Americans since the founding of these United States. And so I, I, I leave you to, to look at the whole book, to look at that and interrogate that even more vitally. But we clearly understand that the way prisons have functioned in this country, as Sister Andrea was saying through, through uh, uh, 
Angela Davis, through many others that have brought out so much, so much important work, Michelle Wallace, Michelle uh, Alexander with uh, uh, the new Jim Crow and so many other works. We know that prisons have been a part of the systematic structural racism that has black people in the conditions we are in today. And therefore, clearly, reparations must be a, uh, are connected in a most serious way to the issues of women who have been incarcerated and ending for all time this kind of, 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 of levels of incarceration of women and girls that we have seen. I end with this from Sister Asata Shakur. It's another book I strongly recommend, Asada and Autobiography. Sister Asada Shakur herself really speaks to the deep, deep tragedy and racial injustices against incarcerated women. And if you read her account of her own life and how her, her torture, her well, under incarceration, her uh, uh, being put into uh, uh, facilities, men, men prisons and other prisons until she was broken out in 1979 by the Black Liberation Army. You really begin to understand just through her one life story, the deep, deep injustices of this system uh, of incarceration and particularly how it has impacted women and girls. But I leave you with, uh, with this. It's just a little poem. Um, just in jail and separated from a child when she, she had a child while she was incarcerated, Kukui, and, um, and they didn't take Kukui away from her. And um, she wrote this poem called Leftovers. What is left? After the bars and the gates and the degradation, what is left? After the lock-ins and the lockouts and the lockups, what is left? I mean, after the chains that get entangled in the gray of one's matter, after the bars that get stuck in the hearts of men and women, what is left? After the tears and disappointments, after the lonely isolation, after the cut wrists and heavy noose, what is left? I mean, like after the commissary kisses, after uh, and, and the get out uh, and get your shit off blues, after the hustler has been hustled, what is left? After the murder burgers and the goon squads and the tear gas and the bulls and the bull pins and the bullshit, what is left? Like after you know that God can't be trusted, after you know that the shrink is a pusher and the, that the word is a whip and the badge is a bullet, what is left? After you know that the dead are still walking, after you realize the silence is talking, that outside and inside are just an illusion, what is left? I mean, like, where is the sun? Where are her arms? And where are her kisses? There are lip prints on my pillow. I am searching. What is left? I mean, like nothing is standstill and nothing is abstract. The wing of a butterfly can't take flight. The foot on my neck is part of a body. The song that I sing is part of an echo. What is left? I mean, like love is specific. Is my mind a machine gun? Is my heart a hacksaw? Can I make freedom real? Yeah, what is left? I am at the top and bottom of a lower archy. I am an earth lover from way back. I am in love with losers and laughter. I am in love with freedom and children. Love is my sword and truth is my compass. What is left? With that, I'll stop and, and, and really open for your, your questions and, your, 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 and, and 
uh, concerns in this uh, uh, very wonderful webinar. Thank you very much, Brother Amilcar. It's, uh, very, very, the two of you are really amazing and very inspiring. And I hope that we will continue uh, with the work that uh, Andrea, you, you, you started and you're doing, and Amilcar, your, your project and your work as well. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, Cole, are you going to ask the question? Uh, uh, I will ask them if you like, Yoav, or you can ask them. Okay, so everybody, please, the, the floor is open to questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, there is one question for you, Andrea. How are you defining community? A community is where you identify uh, with uh, locally, but also globally. Our struggles are global struggles. It's on behalf of the liberation of black people. And we have to be in this struggle locally, whether it's in your hyperlocal community. And we also have to understand how we are connected to this struggle um, uh, uh, globally, how uh, capitalism has uh, destroyed uh, communities globally, um, how greed, how terror from police states, from the control of, of uh, uh, indigent populations and native people around the globe. Um, so we do our work, like I said, um, not from a national perspective, but as a quilt that sits together where we are doing, working together global, uh, uh, collect, uh, collectively locally from our hyper-local communities, meaning the communities that we live in. We all live in the communities most directly affected by incarceration. And also we are deeply connected. We have for the first time this year created the International Commission for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. They are part of our community as well. We have visited seven countries so far at the National Council, and we have many more to join, but our international commission includes women from South Africa, from Haiti, uh, from the Caribbean, from the United States, um, um, from, from uh, Mexico, from, from uh, five Latin American countries. Uh, we've been to Bogota, Argentina. All of the women's stories as formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated women are the same. You could tell a story starting in Argentina and the woman can pick it up and a woman in the Bronx or in Roxbury or in Worcester or in Springfield can end that woman's sentence. This is what we're talking about transforming. And so our community is hyper-local in the neighborhoods that we live in and it also extends pan-Africanism all the way around the globe to our sisters who are under the same oppression and control um, in their communities around the world. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, Amilcar, I wanted to ask you uh, two questions. The first question is when you talk about reparations, you, you mentioned the, the, the crime of mass incarceration and, 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 and the tremendous damage that, that it did to the African-American community. And, and the whole and all of us uh, here, but you did not go back to the issue of slavery. Uh, the, the, the second question, I understand that in some places, I think in Kentucky, I'm not sure exactly where, but th there, what is the state of the campaign for reparations nowadays? Thank you very much. So uh, the campaign has really gotten to uh, a place of what um, uh, I was uh, recently seeing a, a tweet from uh, Professor Darity of what's called the Overton uh, window. Um, and this is a term amongst the, the scholars uh, that uh, holds that um, 
when you're trying to look at uh, a range of policies, uh, you have to look at what's politically acceptable to the mainstream population at a given time. Uh, and, and, it's, and, and so initially things can come, certain policies or ideas can be uh, in a realm of unthinkable. When I first learned of the uh, Afri black reparations, the struggle for black reparations uh, back in the 70s and, the, and in the early 80s, um, basically uh, the whole notion of reparations for black people in the United States for slavery straight on up um, was, was in the realm of what was called unthinkable, okay? We kept working at it, we kept working at it, then it became in the realm of radical. Okay, then it has moved a little bit after the, the millennium into the realm of acceptable within political discourse. And I was recently looking at during, uh, in 2010, uh, when Barack Obama was president, we got very little help, very little support for him. His words about it was, he was very ambivalent. He, he had certain concerns. You know, he, he, he was, it was an acceptable idea to think about, to talk about. It wasn't deemed just super too radical, but he was ambivalent as the president and he really did nothing to help the struggle. His eight years in office, he did nothing. And his friend, Henry Louis Gates, Dr. Gates down the street at Cambridge wrote an op-ed to give him political cover talking about reparations being still a very div div divisive issue being a very divisive and that, uh, uh, you know, we, we have to realize that blacks played a part in the slave trade. There were blacks who helped to, to put black people in, into the slave boats and into the slave. All of that's garbage now. And it's all water under the bridge. We have moved this issue of reparations for slavery and anti-black racism now into the realm where it's a sensible idea. It's a sensible idea. It's now, how do we operationalize it? How do we get the measures through? And I really hope after we, get the, we take the trash out of the White House and under a new administration and a new House and a new Senate, we're gonna get H.R. 40 passed, of which our own legislators here in Massachusetts, Congressman McGovern, McGovern is a signature of H.R. 40, which is the House resolution to set up a commission to begin to study and to enact a program of black reparations. So we're, we're getting there. And we just got to, in November, go, go to the polls massively to take out the trash in the White House so we can move this thing forward and, and uh, uh, come January, come February, get, it, get this thing going. And I'm, I'm making another prediction for you now, as I did at the Martin Luther King event, in January, I'm making one now in Black August. Black August resistance. Come next January, February, soon as after the inauguration, after the swearing in, we're moving this question of reparations into action and into a definable program. So I'm telling you, start looking at the incarceration issues of women and girls, start looking at these issues into how does it connect to a program of black reparations? And how do we uh, uh, draw the linkages between the historical injustices of black women from slave time to now? And begin to look at how the monies and how the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the pre-reparations education work can begin to happen for formerly incarcerated women and girls, as well as presently incarcerated women and girls, because when Black families start having the money come from the reparations, they're going to be able to then say, look, let my daughter out. Let my sister go. I've got money, I've got a home, I've got a place set up for her. There's no reason to keep her in with two more years left on her sentence or five years or whatever it is. Bring her home. I've got a home now. I've got room, I've got space. We've got money to help her begin to readjust to free life. So I'm telling you now, begin to look at the program 
of uh, uh, the, the Black Program for Reparations and connect it to the conditions of incarcerated women and girls and formerly incarcerated women and girls because the money is coming and we're going to be able to use that to provide the necessary transitions for women to be safe, to be able to transition from prison to free life. So this is moving, Yoav, this is moving people. We've just got to get behind it. We can't let people with all of their oh, questions derail us. We have to be very forthright. This is owed. Pay what you owe. And with this funds, and, and uh, we are going to rebuild our lives. We are going to be able from the bottom up to help our incarcerated brothers and sisters transition into freedom transition back into the community where they can have complete lives, whole lives, and stay free and not revolving door back into prison because there's no money and there's no jobs and there's no training programs and there's no nothing. And so they come out and they start falling into right back into the negative patterns that suck them right back into prison. No, recidivism problem, revolving door problem is over with black reparations and the work of black reparations. I'm not saying it's just all solved by a check. I'm saying this is a program. This is a movement. And if we get behind it and we support it, we let our Congress people know. I, 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 at the program you had in January, I sat next to McGovern. We talked about this. McGovern is on board. He's already signed for HR 40. I've talked with Warren, you know, Warren and, and, and uh, um, whoever comes out of the election, Markey or Kennedy, I don't care, but they got to cast the right vote and they got to do the work in the Senate. So this thing is moving and we really have, and I really look forward to how it's going to impact positively the conditions of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls. Well, brother Amilcar and sister Andrea, I'm 100% with you. And I, I believe that most people at the Massachusetts Peace Action, my organization, will support this campaign. My hope is that all of us together work as hard as we can to make it, to make it happen. And as you said, let's see if we can do it, that it will happen by next, next year. So I, I'm hoping that this, is, this, this webinar is going to be the beginning of the Massachusetts Peace Action community going behind these two projects. Brother so, Yoav, if I may just add something before um, I have to leave, I just wanted to say uh, I went into the Q and A. There's a couple of questions about how people can get engaged and involved. Um, please, if you send us uh, an email at info at the council.us, info at the council.us. And I can put it into um, an answer, uh, but I can type it in. Um, but uh, also I'm asking for the support of everybody who can hear my voice. We have a campaign to end incarceration of women and girls in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We should be a model for the rest of the country about how this can be done. We have one of the smallest incarceration populations in the United States of incarcerated women. We can end incarceration of women and girls in the Commonwealth and be a model for the rest of the country. Right now, however, our governor uh, uh, Baker is proposing a $50 million new women's prison. We have worked day and night to stop this. We don't need it. We currently have about 150 women incarcerated in the women's prison at Framingham. That is a tiny number of women. And we have other alternatives and we know what the sisters inside need. Between getting those sisters out and bringing them back into their communities and using clemency to work on the lifers, the small lifer population at Framingham, we can literally end incarceration of women and girls. We shall not, we should not, we will not allow 
for $50 million. And that is just the beginning to be used a bond revenue. That is debt that the governor is pushing to pay for the building of a new women's prison for 150 women. We must not allow this. This is a campaign that we are waging a war. We are waging in Massachusetts to not allow this to happen. We have temporarily Looks like we are losing Andrea. Can Andrea. you hear me now? Yes, we can, Andrea. I'm sorry. And we went and met with the architects and we asked them to please do not do this. Two of the architects left the process and said, we shall not build this, be a part of building a women's prison. The third architect those two architects were local to Massachusetts and they left. They decided to not go after the bid. The third architect is a big national prison builder. He loves building prisons and he's gonna build this one if he has the opportunity. We have to send a resounding message to Governor Baker that we will not allow this to happen in the Commonwealth. And we need your support. We need everybody's support on this. We also derailed it because we found out that the Commonwealth did not publish the bid for the architectural design. And that caused them to have to take it down and start over. They have not republished it, but they are still intent. The DOC and the governor is still just assuming that they are going to go ahead and build this prison. We need help. We have 11 women right now also at Framingham who are elderly and who are sick and they need to come home through clemency. We can bring these women home, women like Angie Jefferson, who have been in prison for decades. Angie is the mother of the prison. She has helped more women through their incarceration over the decades that she has been incarcerated. Angie deserves the right to come home. So these are the two main things that we are asking for help with. Um, there's also, just so people have a full understanding, in addition to $50 million new women's prison, they're proposing a new county jail in Suffolk County. They're proposing a $40 million increase to the Department of Correction, and they've proposed a $90 million budget to pay for new police vehicles for the state police. This is what we are battling in our local organizing work at Families for Justice as Healing. Please get involved. Um, uh, you can email me, you can email us at info um, at the council.us. I'm going to try and figure out how to, I can definitely put it in the chat. Can all the panelists see the chat or just us? You can put the link to all panelists and attendees. Just go to the drop down screen and put all panelists and attendees. And I tried to, yep. Thank you, brother. I'm okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. I'm going to put uh, the, the email addresses in there. Um, please and i'll put mine in there as well um please either one of these will work and we can tell you how you can get involved in helping us we're in a fight um and we're not going to allow for a new women's prison to be built when we can end incarceration of women and girls and be a model for how to scale this in states with larger populations if we can't if we can do this Everybody can do this, but we can definitely do it in Massachusetts, and we should not any of us allow for a $50 million prison to be built. Wholeheartedly agree with you. Let me pick up, too, on some other questions that I'm seeing. First of all, on the of dangerous personalities, the 1% who whatever are just dangerous people. You know, that, that, that we don't have to spend too much time with. Uh, there, there are ways to protect the population from people who can't function right now out there without being doing bad things, okay? We all understand that. We all get that. But just to throw that out there, that cannot happen to then justify this kind of massive uh, prison 
uh, society we have here in the United States with over 2 million people uh, just at the, at the uh, uh, prison level to say nothing of, of all the other jails and everything else. This, this is, we've gone way too far from anything that can be justified by the fact that there are some people who uh, their mental health, their whatever is so compromised that they cannot uh, 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 be out uh, uh, freely in society without doing something bad to somebody. We all get that. So let's let let let's let that suffice. And then quickly on um, question of black reparations and indigenous people. You know, indigenous people uh, are a sovereign people, and so I can't. You know, I will not. Uh, 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 attempt to speak for uh, indigenous people and their struggles around reparations. Some of the, and because you're talking many different groups and many different sovereign people, some of whom are, who are very effectively address those issues for themselves. Joe Biden was on uh, a, a webinar recently that the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People uh, hosted. And the host, uh, formerly brother used to be with uh, uh, BET, uh, asked him about reparation. And he goes into this dodge about, well, if we, if, you know, if whatever comes before me, you know, links uh, the indigenous Native American, I think he said, people with the, with the reparations program, then, you know, then it's something I'll look at. That is bullshit, okay? We, you cannot tell me that the fight of sovereign nations that they can't get their justice until somebody deals with, with the, injustice, the historical injustices against black people. And likewise, you can't come and tell me, you can't, you know, oh, I'm not gonna talk about or deal with the historical injustices of black people until we also link into it, what's going on with the Wampanoag and what's going on with the Cherokee and what's going on with uh, uh, the Dene Nation and what's going, no. Deal with the black reparations problem as the black reparations problem and deal with your indigenous peoples, the various first nations of this country, deal with that too. It's like you're saying, we can't walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. Federal government has to do right and do better and do right by our first nations and their various claims for uh, broken treaties and claims for, uh, 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 as sovereign for their sovereign rights, for reparations, and deal with that. Yes, I absolutely 100% say deal with that. But don't link and tell me you can't deal with H.R. 40 until everything else is thrown in and everything else is figured out and put into it as well. That's a cop out. That's bullshit. And Biden knows better. Well, I think that. Uh... I want to thank uh, Andrea and Amilcar uh, deeply for, for your presentation and your, your passion and your leadership. And I can promise you that I and my friends will do whatever we can to help the campaign to end incarceration of women and girls and to bring about uh, reparation, and, reparation and justice uh, to the African American community. So uh, I don't see, I mean, there are, um, I think that you basically answered the questions that were asked. And so we will be in touch and continue to work together. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for this in, uh, invitation. It was an honor to be on here with all of you and uh, brother Amoka, uh, it was an honor to be with you. Thank Keep you so the work, very Sister much. Andrew. Thank Keep you. Up the work, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. Bye. Bye bye.